Our gospel reading continues, picking up with verse 16 from John 6. When evening came, Jesus' disciples went down to the lake, got into a boat, and started across the lake to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The lake became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the lake and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I have a piece of trivia for you. What is the only miracle of Jesus that occurs in all four Gospels? Loaves and the fishes. Loaves and the fishes. Good job. Good job. The sixth chapter of the Gospel of John opens with the telling of one of the most widely known miracles of Jesus, the loaves and the fishes, or the feeding of the thousands. It is the only miracle of Jesus that occurs in all four of the Gospels. The early Christians found this story so compelling, so important, that each of the evangelists included it in their Gospel accounts. And both Matthew and Mark have two versions of the miracle. So if you don't have plans after lunch today, look those up and read them and compare them. Of course, the hazard of familiar stories is that it's easy for us to miss the finer points of details because we are hearing the story that we already know in our mind, and so we forget to listen to precisely what is being said. As I read and studied the text this week, there were two verses particularly that jumped out at me that I don't recall ever having paid much attention to or even noticing. Following the miracle of the feeding, verse 15 says, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Similarly, the scene which reports the miracle of Jesus walking on water ends, then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. Why these details? I've sat with this question, I've wrestled with it, and prayerfully considered it. And the conclusion I've reached, at least right now, is this. These details point to a human tendency still very much prevalent today. And it is one that we as followers and disciples of Jesus need to be aware of, alert to, and actively resist. We humans tend to want to take Jesus as our own, to force him into a mold that meets our needs and fits our purposes. In the text, the people want to make him king, and he withdraws. They want to bring Jesus into their boat, and immediately the boat reaches shore. Jesus is not the embodied word of God to fill the power roles that this world and our society has created. Jesus is the embodied word of God in order that this world and its roles may be transformed to conform to the vision of God. It's the difference between inviting Jesus to come into our boat and our being bold enough to step out of our boat and come onto Jesus' boat. I recognize that this is scary and hard work, and yet it's the work that discipleship calls us into. It's scary and it's hard because when we step into Jesus' boat, we may be on a boat with people that surprise us. We may find ourselves with people who make us uncomfortable. 
We may be with people who, if we are being totally honest, we simply don't want to share a boat with. It is scary and hard because when we step onto Jesus' boat, we don't always know where it's going to take us. So friends, be aware of, alert to, and actively resist taking Jesus as your own mascot or celebrity endorser for the projects, the positions, or agendas that you feel drawn to and passionate about. Certainly be aware of, alert to, and actively resist those who in private or public secular or sacred arenas do this. I'm not saying that faith should not inform the projects, positions, or agendas with which we hold or actively engage. Quite the opposite. Faith ought to be an active and a foundational engagement and conversation partner in the formation of those ideas, those opinions, and those stances. Yet the call of discipleship is to follow Jesus. The key is allowing our discipleship to form and to transform those ideas, opinions, and stances that we hold, rather than co-opting and forcing Jesus into a mold that meets our needs or fits our purposes. So what does Jesus do in this text, aside from resist being forced to be king and taken into the people's boat? Jesus demonstrates a strong proclivity for situational awareness. He notices the large crowd. He knows mealtime is drawing near, and before people are coming to him expressing hunger, he is raising the need to the disciples. Jesus sees the need and goes towards the need. He goes towards the need in care and in compassion. Take note of what is not in the text. Absent is making the crowd come forward to say that they are hungry and have no food. They aren't put in a position to beg to have their basic human need met. Neither does Jesus question them, belittle or demean them for not being prepared or having the means to meet their own needs. Jesus sees the need and goes toward the need in care and compassion. The voices represented in the narrative by Philip and Andrew make a certain amount of good sense. And I believe that it's the way that they are attempting and seeking to extend care and kindness to the community. And yet, they voice the reality only as they see it. And it is a view of scarcity. It's a reality that only factors in what they bring to the table. And it doesn't factor in God and what God is able to achieve. In comparison, Jesus demonstrates abundance and that God can provide abundance even amid scarcity. Remember, unleavened bread was a sign for the Hebrew people that it was God who liberated them from Pharaoh's grip. The Israelites lived a life of scarcity in the wilderness and it was through God's work, through God's gift of manna that they were able to survive. In the narrative of God's people, bread is a sign of God's care and providing for the needs of the people. Today's text has the people faced with a dire situation, a situation of scarcity. And what does Jesus do? Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to the people. And with the fish, he did the same giving them as much as they wanted. The feeding happened until they were all satisfied, at which point Jesus tells the disciples to gather the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. What does Jesus do? 
Jesus takes bread, a central sign of God's care, and in handing it to the people, he gives them not a meal of scarcity, but he offers them a feast of abundance, a feast in which they are satisfied, an abundant table in which there are leftovers. With the sign of the bread, Jesus offers a hungry world filled with scarcity, an abundance that is possible only through the hand of God. I don't believe that Jesus tests Philip and Andrew to shame them. He tests them so that all may see Jesus is more than a prophet. He is more than an earthly king. Jesus is Lord, the very Son of God. To close today, I want us to share in the epistle reading for this day. It serves as a wonderful exclamation point to the message of today's gospel reading. And while it is Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus, I hope that it can be our mutual blessing and our prayer for the church of Jesus Christ today, and mine particularly for you. Let's share together. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory, the church, and in Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen.